Uh, you're recording, so you're good. Okay, I'll have to remember that then. Okay. okay. It's all you. Thank you. Welcome to our Box Elder training this morning on defensive driving. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started here. I wanna welcome everybody who's watching this uh, Zoom meeting. So I'd like you to think about what a defensive driver is and what being a defensive driver means to you. So a defensive driver, being a defensive driver, being a decisive driver and being a dependable driver. A defensive driver is someone who drives so as to prevent accidents in spite of the actions of others and the presence of adverse driving conditions. We should expect the unexpected actions of others. We should adjust our driving and weather as traffic conditions change. Being a decisive driver is also important. 75% of accidents are preventable, typically due to driver error and those choices that we make. The key to accident prevention is being decisive and making decisions in time and making good decisions. So what does a defensive driver see here? Well, the lights turned yellow and it's about to turn red. You're gonna to have to make a decision. Do I hurry on through the light or do I safely stop? And that decision uh, should be made in time and then followed through. Being a dependable driver, is knowing what the laws are and obeying the laws and developing good driving habits. I know that when I've had several teenagers who have been through driver's education and they're always really good at the first two, they know the laws and they try really hard to obey those that develop good driving habits. That takes time and experience in order to do that. Good driving habits, being farsighted, <clears throat> don't be nearsighted, move your eyes continuously. In other words, don't just stare at the road in front of you. Take in the whole picture, maintain that space cushion and drive alone. Keep your focus. You can't afford being a distracted driver. And we're gonna talk about distractions at the here in a little bit. And communicate. Being farsighted might be in the city that we're looking ahead one to two blocks or in the country, it might be that we're looking ahead even a, a mile. So what does a defensive driver see here? We've got a white vehicle that's making a left turn in front of us. Uh, we've got uh, a stoplight that's green at the moment and quite a bit of traffic. What does a defensive driver see here? Well, for one thing, we've got two or three lanes because of construction in these cones here that are going to one lane. So we're gonna have to prepare to safely move over into the left lane. We also notice that there's a semi truck here that's going uphill and rounding the corner. And once we reach this point around the corner and uh, we might have some slow traffic there that we have to watch out for. Here we have a stop sign and we have this little hill that we can't see what's on the other side of it. We, we can see that there's a pedestrian crosswalk. So we need to be careful if anyone is crossing at that point. It's important to keep our eyes moving, to not stare and to check the rear and side view mirrors, to check for oncoming and cross traffic about every three seconds. All right, so what does a defensive driver see here? We see that we have a bus in front of us. The, the light is turning yellow, but we've also got a pedestrian here that has started to enter the crosswalk, <clears throat> made her intentions known that she's going to cross here. So 
we need to stop for pedestrians. We also have put some pedestrians crossing uh, here on the on the left, and we need to give them the right of way. And once they enter the crosswalk, we need to stop whether we're in the right lane or the left lane, and and give them the the full right of way there. Nighttime driving can be more hazardous than daytime driving, and uh, we need to be conspicuous. We need to be courteous. We need to be cautious because the death rate at night is four times the daytime death rate for, for accidents. And if you think about it, what are the things that make nighttime driving more hazardous than driving during the day? One of the things is it's limited visibility. We're only allowed to see as far as our headlights. And when those are on dim, sometimes that's, or, or we're in uh, fog or some bad weather, that isn't very far. Also, there's a lot of animals that come out at night, deer and other animals here, here in Utah, they come down, especially during the winter, down on the roads to lick salt and find more food. And so we need to watch out for them. And all critters that you find seem to come out more at night than they do during the day. Also, there's more of a prevalence of uh, people who are driving impaired or drowsy at night than there is during the day. It's important that we take in the whole picture. We look at cross streets, alleyways, pedestrians, parallel parking, construction vehicles, or any animals. Here we need to be prepared if we're in this white car here um, heading toward the stoplight and if it changes green right now, we need to be prepared this other car here is gonna go through the light. So we need to yield to oncoming traffic. It's always important that we maintain a space cushion between us and, and the next car, especially in front of us, but also that space cushion cars to the side of us. Whenever possible, drive alone. And that doesn't mean that you can't carry passengers. That just means that you don't ride in a crowd and that you don't get too close to the next car. Leave that space cushion to the front, rear, and side. And I do know that sometimes that can be, if you're traveling on the interstate, that can be difficult to do as you leave that space cushion and what happens, another car comes and pulls right in front of you and, and there goes your space cushion. But leave that when you can, uh, slow down, don't tailgate, allow more space than one vehicle length for every 10 miles per hour and maintain that cushion when you're stopped. Avoid staying in others' blind spots. You know, on, on big trucks like this truck here, we should also always remember that the passing side is the left-hand side. The drivers have more visibility with their mirrors and they can see a lot better <coughs> those vehicles that are in this lane that are passing them on the left side. I remember seeing a uh, bumper sticker on, on trucks. I've seen this several times where it says, passing side, left side, suicide, right side. So if you pass on the right, the trucks have more limited visibility and it's important that we stay out of their blind spot. This car here, it's a little bit too close for this Colt Vista that's up in front of them. They haven't allowed that space cushion. So what can happen if a car rolls back or if it's a stick shift and they're uphill just a little ways as they get going, they might roll back into you. You wanna maintain that space cushion. We've all heard of the two second rule, two to three seconds. So, and, and they teach this in driver's education. When you're following a vehicle on the highway, um, you should pick a, a sign or something and see how many seconds you are. If, if they pass a sign, then count 1001, 1002, and you should always maintain that two to three seconds uh, if, of, of travel time when of space cushion when you're traveling on the highway. Just some photos here showing to, we've got a car, a, a vehicle on the right, looks like they're going into the right hand lane. All right, usually when I have a live audience, I talk about distractions. I'd like you to think about the worst distraction with well, the worst distracted driver situation that you've seen. I've seen people doing almost all of these things. I, I haven't seen anybody using a laptop, but I've seen people clearly 
texting on their cell phone. I've seen people eating and drinking, combing their hair, putting on makeup. And all of these are distractions. There was a Virginia Tech study that found that nearly 80% of crashes and 65% of near crashes involved some form of driver distraction within three seconds before the event. Primary distractions are reaching for a moving object, looking at an external object, reading, makeup, cell phone dialing, or even talking or listening to a, to a handheld device, even the radio. If we turn up the radio, and now of course everybody has their radio on their phone and, and they can, they have their playlists and everything, but even putting those on and adjusting the volume and things like that can be a big distraction. Um, we've talked about most of these passengers, cell phones, grooming, sunshine, even looking at an accident and not paying attention to our travel path can be uh, a distraction. The problem with distractions is they, they reduce our stopping time. What happens when we see a hazard ahead and we need to stop suddenly? If we're looking at the road, we have our reaction time. Then we also have our braking time. That braking time is dependent on the vehicle that you're in, how, how good the tires are and how much friction you have between the tires and the road, what the road surface is. And that determines your stopping distance, that and your speed. Well, if we're distracted for one second or a half a second, we can, that reduces our, or that increases the amount of, of distance that we're gonna travel before we're able to come to a stop. Sometimes it doesn't make a difference. Sometimes half a second or a second does not make a difference. We still have plenty of time. But if we're too close to the hazard and we don't see it in time, we might have, have an accident because of that reduced time. And that's all compounded. The faster you drive, the less time you have to react to an accident and the more serious the accident is likely to be due to that increased speed. Let's talk about communication. Sometimes we communicate with hand signals and there's a good way to communicate with hand signals and, and not a good way. The, the not good way is to give someone a gesture with one finger or to shake your fist at, at someone. Um, the good way to use hand signals, maybe you've gone, come to a four-way stop and you want the other person to go first, you can wave them on through. And there, so we can use hand signals, but the most important thing that we can do <coughs> to communicate properly is to use our turn signals. Every time we go to turn, change lanes, we need to make our intentions known. And the way that we do that is by signaling. And signaling should be done a few seconds before we turn or before we want to get into that, uh, before we want to change lanes. Also headlights and brake, and brake lights are a signal. Make sure that your headlights are working good and, and your car is in good, good order. The headlights, you know, we should at, at times when we don't have oncoming traffic, we should use those on brights at night, but we shouldn't bright other, other cars. And if the other car has their brights on and you want to hurry and, and flash them, you know, hey, turn off your headlights, that's okay. But if they don't turn off their headlights, don't turn on your uh, brights. If they don't turn off their brights, don't turn on your brights just to punish them. Uh, they may not be able to be, they may be carrying a load and those lights may be up and they, they may not have the ability to dim their lights. All right, when do we use the horn? So we should use the horn to warn other drivers. Um, hey, I'm coming through or maybe they're encroaching on your lane. Maybe they don't see you as they're changing lanes. It's okay to use the horn to tap on the horn and say, hey, I'm here in the lane. You can't come in this lane right now, but we shouldn't use the horn <clears throat> to punish people. We shouldn't use it and we shouldn't keep, you know, hitting the horn in order, it just sends a bad message. Um, an eye contact, keep an eye on, on what other drivers are doing. It's also important that we talked about distracted driving. If we're driving, 
with the radio too loud, we cannot hear emergency vehicles. We cannot hear trains. We cannot hear others communicating by horn. It's important that we're able to see and hear emergency vehicles. And I just wanna talk for just a minute about what we do when we're approaching uh, a emergency vehicle, whether it's a fire truck, an ambulance, or a police car, a sheriff's vehicle, if they have someone pulled over or they're on the side of the road, not even in our lane, we have the pullover rule. We're supposed to, if it's safe to do so, get in the other lane, get in the lane that not in the, the lane next to, not in the, the far right lane if they're in the, if they're off to the right. It's important that we pull over so that we don't, we've had too many incidents of emergency personnel being struck by another vehicle. And, and that gets even worse on slippery roads and in, in the winter time or fog. So if you see those lights, make sure that you move over if it's safe to do so. If you can't, just because there's too much traffic, then sub slow down substantially as you pass by that emergency vehicle. Our hearing can also alert us to trains and or others who are communicating by horn. So make sure that we're not uh, if we're listening to the radio, that's fine, but it's not turned up so loud that we can't hear other warning signs. Trains can be hazardous. And so if we come across this situation and we see the flashing lights, we need to prepare to stop, to slow down and stop and not try and race through and have the arm hit us as it's, as it's coming down. So we need to be careful. We see those flashing lights, it means a train's on the, on the tracks but there aren't train tracks all of the time. Sometimes uh, there's just a, like this, a railroad crossing. And so uh, a railroad crossing like this, and sometimes there's a stop sign or a yield sign. So we've got train tracks here. We also notice that there's a train here that we might have to watch out for. One note about train and vehicle accidents, because of their momentum, and their weight, whenever there's a crash between an accident between a train and another vehicle, the train always wins. The train is always, uh, it's always gonna be bad <laughs> uh, and can be really bad depending on the speed of the, the train because they can't stop as quickly as vehicles can. We also need to pay attention to our feelings. We can sometimes tell when we're skidding, when we're driving on slippery roads, when we have reduced acceleration or unstable steering or our brakes aren't working, or if we have a flat tire. Um, some of us have low, uh, low tire pressure indicators in our newer vehicles. Sometimes you just feel it and it's that, that clunky sound, you, hey, I've got a flat tire. And so we need to know to be prepared for those situations. If our wheels do go off the road while we're driving, um, we need to not panic and don't brake suddenly. That can make things worse. Slow down gradually and then steer back onto the road when it's safe to do so. All right, seat belts. We have much better seat belt usage than we did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and I think that's a good thing. Statistically, seat belts save lives. And I always ask, people in my classes, when I have a live audience, I ask those, okay, how many of you wear your seat belts when you're at home, when you're driving from your home, you know, on those short errands and when you're not on company time, when you're not on uh, working for your employer. And about 90% of the hands go up. And then I, al I also ask those who don't wear their seat belts, I say, so you don't wear your seat belt. And I get different responses when I ask them why. Some people say, well, I just don't like wearing it. Some people say, well, it's a freedom issue. I don't think I should be forced to wear my seatbelt. Others have told me more than one occasion, they, they know of a, a person who had their seatbelt on and they went into a lake or a body of water and they drowned because they couldn't get their seatbelt off. And I, I believe that, um, but I do believe that overall the, the odds are in your favor if you will wear your seatbelt at all time. It's important to remember that most accidents 
uh, most auto crashes occur within a short distance from our homes and at lower speeds. We need to be careful during intersections. We need to expect the unexpected and look both ways and not depend on, on the signal. We need to yield the right of way and be in a position where we can where we can signal and stay in our lane. So the uh, what is this what does this picture show? It's a one way. We need to be careful of one way that we don't go down it the wrong way. Also, there's some limited visibility because of the shrubbery on and the trees on the on the side here. This vehicle here is making a left-hand turn, but it looks like they're going in the far lane rather than choosing the close lane. So we need to be prepared for that. All right, is this big truck with the pup trailer on it, why do they have this big space here to the right? As, as they, are they doing that so that a person in a little car can come up here and turn right? No, they're doing that because trucks like this, especially pulling a long trailer, they need all this extra room in order to make a wide turn. And so we need to give trucks their space and stay out of that right side of them when they are turning especially. If the truck was to be over here closer to the curb, they're gonna run into the curb as they make that turn and that wouldn't be a good thing. The other thing that we notice is there's no traffic lights. And I don't know if this is a new traffic light that they don't have power to it yet, or if just the power is out. But we need to remember that um, traffic lights like that, we should treat those as a four-way stop when the traffic lights aren't working. To avoid, we need to avoid being in a collision with the car in front of us or to avoid being rear-ended. Sometimes if we think a car is coming too quickly, we can speed up momentarily just so they won't hit us as hard. And really, we need to be careful when we're backing. What do you think happened here? Do you think that the minivan backed into the police vehicle or do you think the police vehicle ran into the, to the minivan? I don't know for sure, but I think the police vehicle ran rear-ended the minivan. When we're backing, we should plan ahead and try to pull into a parking spot rather than backing if we can. We should do a circle check around us and we should back immediately. That circle check means that you walk around your vehicle and you look for anything, you know, kids or any toys or anything, pets, anything that is in your way because you don't wanna back over it. You make sure that it's safe to back out. And then once you do back up immediately while backing up slowly. Remember to do that circle check. If you're passing, you check the road. You should make sure that it's safe to pass, that you have plenty of room in order to pass. Communicate by turning on your signal, hey, I'm going to pass, and then be brisk. It doesn't mean that you have to floor it, but you should be quick about it. And you should make your pass as quickly as possible um, and then maintain that space cushion and then resume speed. You've probably had it happen before to you. Um, I know I have to me where a car comes and they pass and they pull right in front of you and then they slow down. And it's like, why did you pass me if you're not going much faster than I am? So it's important that we maintain that space cushion and that we resume speed. Head on accidents can happen on a straight road or a curve. We need to have good viewing habits, continuously scan, uh, where we're driving and be farsighted. All right, what do we notice here? So if we're driving here as we meet this Mustang, the Mustang is pulled over the, the center line because they're trying to give this family that's walking down the road with their pet, they're trying to give them space. So 
maybe this the driver of the Mustang should have waited a little bit. So there's not a potential for an accident until this car passes, until they have a clear path of travel, and then slowly, slowly pull uh, around the family that's walking down the road. All right, if you're driving toward this overpass here, toward this bridge, what do you notice? What is this blue car trying to do? They're crossing over the line. Are they going to make a U-turn? Are they just distracted? Are they going to stay in their lane here? Who knows? And so a defensive driver needs to make sure that they a defensive driver needs to make sure that they are not, that they are prepared to handle the actions of this driver here. All right, let's talk a minute about driver fatigue. So we have all probably, unfortunately, driven before when we're a little bit sleepy. Hopefully not a lot sleepy. But if we're sleep deprived, for most people need seven, eight hours sleep. Some people need a little bit less. Some people need a little bit more. If we're sleep deprived or, or fatigued um, less than six hours, it triples your risk of getting in an accident. And suffering from sleep loss, insomnia, it might be sleep apnea, poor quality sleep, or some form of sleep debt. We build up a debt if we're not, you know, if we're going without sleep night after night, especially, we build up that sleep debt. And it can also affect us if we're driving long distances without proper rest breaks. And, and even driving through the night, even sometimes if we try and drive through the night, but we've got plenty of sleep before, our body has what they call that circadian rhythm. And it tells us that we, we have different hormone levels <clears throat> at night than we do during the day and different levels of alertness. And at night, our bodies are telling us, hey, we're accustomed to sleeping. And we are, they're telling us, hey, you should be asleep. So we get sleepy at night and because that's the time that most people sleep. It can also be, fatigue can also be brought on by any medications that we're taking, any antidepressants, even cold medication, Benadryl or NyQuil or things like that, those, those can make me very, very sleepy. So what do we do to avoid, I'll go back to this, what do we do it to avoid driver fatigue? What should we do? So the best thing that we can do is to get a good night's sleep or if we become real sleepy while we're driving, Hopefully we've got another driver that's more alert that we can trade off. Or if we can safely pull in to a rest stop or a truck stop or a, a safe place to park and, and we feel safe about it, then we might could take a nap, take a rest break. Um, there's also some things that we can do that can help out, that, uh, but they're short term. We can, you know, take some stimulants, a cup of coffee or an energy drink. For me, those work good for about an hour if I'm sleepy, but then after that, I really want to crash. So those can be a temporary, uh, a temporary fix for, for driver fatigue, but the best thing to do is just get an adequate night's rest. So we need to remember to be de defensive, drive, uh, uh, taking into account, a defensive driver is one who takes into account the and drives defensively, drives safely in spite of the actions of others and in spite of bad weather conditions. A decisive driver is one who makes good decisions and then acts in time. And a dependable driver is one who is consistent, one who knows the rules, one who knows the laws, and who follows them. Thank you for attending our defensive driving class today. And our, our motto at WCF Insurance is be careful out there. So be careful on the roads, be careful as you drive, and have a good day. Thank you.